Hello, this is Bryant Myers, and welcome to another episode of Debunking Flat Earth. In this episode, we're going to look at reference frames and fictitious forces because I've been noticing a lot in my little debates that are going on in the comments under each of these videos, and they keep bringing up this idea that gravity isn't real, centrifugal force isn't real, it's a fictitious force, it's a, you know, it's an inertial force, you know, if you look at an inertial reference frame, the force isn't there, etc., etc. So I, I kind of just got tired of this argument coming from many different flat earthers, including Witsit. And I want to go through an email that he sent me recently. And, and here, here's the email here. Um, and the, what I want to mainly go over in this video is this part that's highlighted. And, um, and it, but just leading up to that, he's basically saying that this quote wasn't meant to support his model because, of course, I don't believe in general relativity and that stars are trillions of miles away. You know, he believes in this local dense ether model. But then why did he use that quote during our debate as his main piece of positive evidence during where he's supposed to be supporting a stationary Earth? And, and he used it to invoke that these Coriolis and centrifugal effects can come about um, from this frame dragging. And of course, I showed that's 10 orders of magnitude off in the last video. But, but here, he, he, like, like other flat earthers recently, he is also saying if the Earth is stationary and there is an ether acting as the medium of exchange for the translation of motion connected to celestial movement, then this could only result in a Coriolis and centrifugal effect. This is objective. The only difference is they would be actual as opposed to your stupid backwards fairy tale of a worldview that claims they are pseudo and fictitious forces. So now, he clearly doesn't understand what a pseudo or fictitious force is. And what he also doesn't understand, regardless if you use an ether or any, this is what I emailed back to him, I said, listen, Witsit, you know, whatever model you use, even if it's an incorrect one, you're still going to need another reference frame from which everything is rotating within. And these are still going to be apparent and fictitious forms, or whatever word you want to use, they're going to be the same type of forces within your model, if you're, of course, that's a big if, assuming his model was correct. But no, he is saying that these Coriolis and centrifugal effects can come about from this, this frame dragging of the ether. So a lot of this is coming from Ken Wheeler and some other fringe type of uh, new age scientists that invoke the flower of life and double Taurus and, you know, and it's all fascinating stuff, don't get me wrong, but it just has no evidence to back it up. These are models that are just pure conjecture with, with literally no solid evidence at all. Now, I did, I did get Rachie, um, Rachie's permission to share her post here. So the Coriolis, I mean, it is an apparent force. It is a fictitious force, a pseudo force, or an inertial force. I prefer the word inertial force because it's not fictitious in the re reference frame that you're in. It's a very real force. So you can see the little red X's here. She says this is not a real force. There is no force acting on the object. Well, that's just demonstrably false um, within the inertial reference frame you're in. Now, here's the key. You know, we're here on Earth, and so if we're like flying a plane or firing a ballistic, we don't care what someone out in space sees in their um, inertial frame. We need to know what these forces are here in our non-inertial frame on Earth, and they are very real forces because they create changes of an acceleration. They deflect the bullets, they deflect the plane, and you have to actually use, with a plane, real forces to keep it back on track again. Therefore, the, the Coriolis force is also very real in this frame because it has, I mean, it's a, it's a real measurable force. It has an effect that can create a change of velocity, which is an acceleration. And to say that there's no identical physical source for this fictitious force, well, the physical source for the, is the rotating Earth. I mean, it's spinning very slowly, and these Coriolis and centrifugal uh, forces are incredibly, incredibly weak. But when it comes to long-range ballistics and planes and some other applications art with artillery, etc., it's, incre it's incredibly important to factor these forces in. So um, I kind of wanted to make this video not just about reference frames, but again, debating a lot of these flat earthers within the comments and other places. I'm seeing that there's just a lot of lack of understanding of reference frames. And, and to understand reference frames and forces, you got to first understand a little bit about vector math. And I'm not going to go too deep. I just want to give you a little taste. Now, I don't want to get too much into vectors here, um, but it is important to understand forces. Forces have a magnitude and direction. Now, one of the reasons I know that flat earthers don't get this is a lot of the ones that, especially the Globebusters team and all the people that are ascribing to incoherent dielectric acceleration, 
I mean, they try to say that this downward acceleration is just a bias, like somehow it's just an arrow only. It has no magnitude. Well, there's no arrows in nature where there's just a, a downward or any type of bias with no magnitude with it. I mean, it's just the most, it's just the most ridiculous thing. Displacement is just a vector from one location to another. Velocity is a vector different from speed. When you look at just the speed on your speedometer, that's just a, a magnitude. Velocity is both your compass reading and your speedometer. So those together give you your direction and your magnitude. And then acceleration is a change of speed, like when you slam your foot on the brakes uh, or accelerate. And, and again, when we, when we work with vectors and, and to understand forces, we typically are, are breaking down the vector into the different components, and we can add forces and just add the components, and then we, then we find the resultant force, and, um, and, and this all comes from a free body diagram. But sometimes we have the components, and we want to construct the magnitude, and we want to calculate the angle. And so there, the other way around, this is basically just Pythagorean theorem here. You know, you know these two sides, and you can find the hypotenuse, and that's the magnitude of the vector, and then your tangent here, your arc tangent, is just the inverse tangent, which again, online calculators can do this for you. So, and again, I remember this from doing physics at, in college. When you're working with forces, especially in, well, in any type of forces, I mean, you're doing this all the time. You know, either decomposing the forces into their components, or you're, you're taking the components, adding them together, and creating the magnitude and the direction. So getting into forces now, the reason I'm going through all this is that I want you to have a solid understanding of a force so that you can better understand what a fictitious force is. Because if you don't really understand what a force is, then if you just hear the word fictitious, like flat earthers, you know, they hear like, like Nathan Thompson, hears the word sea level, and he, mean, he thinks that it means you see level, right? Which, of course, that's not even the same, same, same definition for C, S-E-E -E versus S-E-A. Or they say airplane, it's, an airplane is a machine that can fly in the air over a plane, right? But it's these word games, so that when they hear fictitious force, oh, it's not real, gravity's not, you know, gravity, the centrifugal, these aren't real forces because they're fictitious. Again, it's, it's just, they're just hearing words and they're not really going into it and understanding what it actually means. But as I've said in video number four of this series, uh, flat earthers just can't seem to draw a free body diagram to save their lives. And it, and it comes about from understanding there's many different forces that can be acting on these bodies at once. So, I mean, just the basic, you know, the, def, the first definitions we'll hear about a force is a push or a pull. But it's, it's basically some interaction between two or more objects. And they can either be touching through contact, like you're pushing a big crate or, or dragging something or, 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 or pulling on a rope. Or it can be non-contact forces like electrostatic force, the gravitational force, magnetic force. But, but there's definitely, a force causes a change in acceleration. That's one of the main hallmarks of a force. And, you know, when you, when you have a force acting on you, you definitely feel it. We feel acceleration. We feel forces. We can't feel constant velocity. These are just different types of forces that can act on a body. And, and depending on the particular problem you're looking at, you might have one or more of these acting. So when we draw a free body diagram, we're basically putting a point around our object and we're drawing arrows or vectors that represent all the different forces that are acting on our body. And then typically we want to find what the resultant force is, because the resultant force will give you the net acceleration on the object. In order to find that, you need to, again, you need to add up all your forces. I mean, typically it's easiest to break them down into components, and then you add X, Y, Z components, and then you can then sum them up, and then you can do the Pythagorean to get the magnitude, and then you can do you know, inverse tangent, get the angles. And it, it, it's, it's not really that hard, but, you know, it takes a little practice to be able to draw these diagrams and to get all the forces. And once you have all the forces on your free body diagram, it's, it's, it's kind of easy. Sometimes the hard part is, is drawing these diagrams and getting all the forces accurately. And I just want to show you an example here because flat earthers, as I talked about in video number four, they just, they talk about things floating and levitating and weighing less. And, and they're just not making their free body diagrams. They, they think that these are anti-gravity demonstrations when there's just, it's just bad physics. I kind of want to pick on Zach with the Globebusters today. And you can see um, I did leave a comment on the video uh, where he's basically weighing something. Um, he's basically adding from a vent with like a little Tesla coil, he's adding charge. And then he, he sees that this little weight, this, I think it's a brass weight. I, I couldn't get the metals to see how the dissimilar metals would react because that would probably play into it. But he got this 10 gram weight to like weigh about a gram more. 
he's adding charge to it. So if it is like a dispersion type of force that's adding charge and it's creating an added electrostatic force, the free body diagram is going to be, because the weight doesn't change. This is what flat earthers don't get. You guys are not manipulating electrostatics to change the weight of things. You are simply not understanding how to draw a free body diagram. So you would have basically two forces, downward weight and then the downward electrostatic force. And when you found the resultant of those two forces, guess what? It would match what his scale was saying within an error margin. See some of the, and you'll see this throughout his videos, just lack of understanding of basic physics. I mean, this is stuff when I taught high school physics, my high school students understood this. It's just inexcusable, the bad science that they invoke. So now that we have an understanding of forces, I want to add to our little diagram here these, see the bottom row, I added those three, the centrifugal, Coriolis, and the, the Otvus effect. Um, but, but these forces are very real forces in the inertial reference frames that they're in. And let me just give you a few examples. Um, if you slam on the brakes, for example, you're going to feel that's a fictitious force, and you definitely feel it. Because your frame of reference like the, is a moving frame, right? It's an accelerated frame, so when you decelerate, you go forward because your frame came to a rest. So if, if, those, if these forces weren't real, you wouldn't feel anything. If you take a hard turn, that's a fictitious force. It's a centrifugal force. And uh, similarly with, with acceleration, when you're in a plane taking off, you're going to feel a hard acceleration pushing you back in your seat. So an inertial reference frame is a reference frame that's not accelerating. A non-inertial reference frame is simply a reference frame that is accelerating or rotating. And because rotation always creates an acceleration because you're going to get a change in velocity. So th these accelerating frames, like the spinning Earth, uh, do have forces that come about with them. This is basically just a simple two-dimensional rotational motion. But interestingly, the Coriolis and the, the centrifugal forces all come about here. They're, they're all right there. So basically what we're doing is we're just starting, we're basically just converting Newton's laws to polar coordinates. And when we do this change of, of basis of coordinates to, to, to polar, to a rotating frame, we find that these forces just kind of pop right out, just pure kinematics. So in, in this sense, it does seem like these are not real forces because they're just coming about by just looking at the, the, the kinematics of the, of the change of the reference frame. But again, when you, we'll see in a minute, when you apply F equals MA to them, they are very much real forces. So um, I had a little fun doing this because it, I, it kind of surprised myself. It's like I remembered how to do it. It wasn't even that hard. But, it's, but I just want to kind of go to the conclusion down here. So when you do this reference frame, you end up with forces in the R direction and in the, in the angular direction. And these radial forces are respectively just the translational acceleration. So there is just that straight, you know, typical acceleration when you just take the the second derivative of x or whatever, you get just the acceleration in that direction translationally. But this right here now is the centripetal force. So again, this, these, these are the forces as they're looking from an inertial frame, looking at this accelerating frame. But essentially, the centripetal force is, is the, from the perspective of an inertial frame, it sees that when you're rotating, there's a force holding you in orbit. So that's an inward force. But now when you're actually on that rotating frame and you're spinning around, like in a centrifuge machine, now it's a centrifugal force going outward. So it's just a minus sign there, but it's because of the different frames of reference. And depending on which frame you're in, they're, they're both correct in their explanation. But, but if you're going to do all the calculations from the inertial frame, you have to stick within the frame that you're doing it. Because if you, if you switch back and forth, then you get the wrong answers. But, it, but it's better, though, in a lot, of, a lot of situations to calculate these forces within the inertial reference frame. Um, and I put an uppercase A here because this is the acceleration of the frame itself. Now, down here in the theta direction, what comes out is, is the Coriolis, and, and this is the Euler force here. This is if you have now an accelerating angular velocity, or an angular velocity that's changing with time. Now, here on Earth, the angular velocity of the Earth is, is constant. So what I mainly wanted to talk about with this force equation now for, for calculating forces in a non-inertial frame is that you can basically just calculate your resultant force just as you would in an inertial frame. But now, because of the relativity, you've got to subtract off these um, inertial forces, the forces due to the rotation of the frame, for example. And so this is now where the, the centripetal force of the other equation I showed you, because now we're subtracting all that, 
the, all the minuses turn to pluses, so the plus Coriolis is now a minus, the minus centripetal is now a plus centrifugal, so you're, you're kind of subtracting off these um, apparent forces, and these are very real forces, and I wanna, I'm gonna give you a really good analogy to this in a minute. But now the, the, the resultant acceleration to calculate the net acceleration and the rotating frame, you know, just sum all your forces like your, you know, the force of gravity, whatever, if you maybe you have a drag force going on or some other forces, you get your resultant force, but now you have to calculate and factor in the rotational, um, the inertial forces as well. And if you don't, you're gonna get the wrong answers. You absolutely have to factor these in. It, this is a lot of math, I know, but it, it's really interesting. And I just wanna give a solid foundation for explaining the very realness of these fictitious pseudo apparent or i like to use the word inertial force and here's here's the image you know right from the book here this is from taylor's book on classical mechanics nevertheless for an observer in an accelerating frame it is entirely real these are real forces and you need to factor in this this inertial force or you gotta you gotta subtract it off of your normal summation of forces here so like I said, now we're looking at all the forces and we're putting, within our frame, we're putting centrifugal Coriolis and the Otovos effect is Coriolis, just the vertical component. But, but we're putting them on equal footing because we have to factor them in just like we do any other force. And again, you slam on your brakes, you feel that forward motion. You might even hit, hopefully you don't hurt yourself, but you know, you accelerate, you feel that backward motion. You go on these amusement park rides where you're in these spinning centrifuge rides you feel that these are real forces you can't say they're not real forces and yes the the coriolis that deflects a bullet in the airplane is very very subtle yes but it's still there and it still has to be factored in i got a great comment from clive in the comment section of the video i did just the other day this is talking about artillery now because before i kind of talked more about um just 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 long range snipers and, and ballistics but artillery is much longer range and he sent me this link and he actually knew somebody that, that worked with these howitzers. And he said that they absolutely have to factor in for Coriolis. And I did a little bit of the calculations here because these howitzers, they can, their muzzle velocity is 897, let's see, yeah, 897 meters per second. And they have a range of up to 30 kilometers. And in order to, now I did the calculations on the deflection and remember, we found with ballistics like a thousand yards away that it was going to be about a, a 1.5 to 4 inch deflection. But now here, with a 30 kilometer at, at the maximum range, you end up with a deflection of 164 feet or 50 meters. That's a huge distance of deflection. So if they don't factor in Coriolis, they're going to miss their target every time. So these are very real forces. And I, and I have a little fun little clip from the movie Moonraker with James Bond. And this is a centrifuge machine. And I just want to want, it's just a little small little clip. I just want to, you know, watch it. And then we're going to, we're going to talk about it a little bit. The speed is controlled by the instructor from up there. Hmm. Why not try it? Why not? Okay, I didn't play the whole thing, but here's another one from, from, from NASA, I believe. And somebody's in this centrifuge machine. This, this, is, this is not a movie. This is in real life. And here's the thing now to really drive this point home. Now, I've never been in one of these, but certainly just looking at the expression of some of these guys, if you kind of Google it. Um, but of course, we've all been on roller coasters and different centrifuge rides where you're pinned up against a wall, right? So I've, I've experienced those type of G-forces. But now when you get up to like eight, nine or 10 Gs in training like that, I mean, that, that's a powerful G force. And, and, this, and again, this is coming from a fictitious force now. What you're feeling, if, you are ever, if you've ever been in one of these, you are feeling the, the centrifugal force. And it's very real. And if you don't think it's real, try to, <laughs> try to get in one of these and go 10 G and see if you don't think fictitious forces are real. So it's just a really good visualization to drive the point home that even though these inertial forces may not show up in inertial frames of reference outside of the Earth's non-inertial system, it doesn't mean that they're not real within our system. In fact, it's the opposite. They are real forces within our inertial frame. 
now this gets a little more subtle with gravity because it's a little different than, than centrifugal Coriolis in the sense that um, it's more fundamental to do with the nature of space and time. However, from one level, you can think of the gravity as a, a pseudo force or a fictitious force or apparent force or an inertial force because it's, it's, because the gravitational effects, according to Einstein, you know, he was able to now take the whole relativity to another level. So not only are all the laws of physics equivalent within inertial frames, but Einstein was able to extend that to all frames, including accelerating frames. And in order for this to work, you know, space and time need to curve and bend and, you know, out comes general relativity and the 10 tensor equations. And the tensor equations are a result from it being able to work in every, any reference frame. So they're very, very general, very, very difficult to work with. And this is why engineers almost always use Newton's equations because they are a very good approximation. And, 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 and one of the confusions here is that from general relativity, you have this, this idea of gravity being the warping of space and time. But then within general relativity, you can, you, can, you can kind of recover Newton's laws and actually you can calculate forces from within general relativity and you can calculate the force of gravity. The confusion is these two definitions of gravity are, are different and it's unfortunate that they use the same word gravity without distinguishing it because it, it leads to confusion. I mean, especially for flat earthers. I mean, even for, even for scientists and people that kind of know this stuff, it's, it's a little, it, it's very subtle. But as I've talked about in other videos, like right here, is you can, through using certain potential derivations of relativity, you can recover Newton's laws, and you see this correction term here for relativity, as I showed before. So, so one way to put it is that while the warping of space and time itself is not a force, you can use the warping of space and time to calculate the force. But this is an important point because they, when flat earthers try to throw relativity in our face and saying it debunks Newton, it doesn't debunk Newton. Newton's right there when you, in both an approximation uh, power series or within potential formulation. And you can, again, see that this correction term goes to zero for flat space and time. It doesn't go to zero like perihelion and mercury like we talked about before. And certainly doesn't go to zero around black holes and very massive stars. So even in relativity, you can construct these equations of motion, you can have these effective potentials, and then you can calculate the forces from them. So again, just, just a big misunderstanding with a lot of flat earthers. So, but, but it is interesting that gravity itself can be, be seen as kind of a pseudo force or a fictitious force, but yet it's very real. I mean, just, just drop like this book on my foot right now. I mean, I would definitely feel that. The force of gravity is real here in our inertial frame. And and here's an interesting little thing, just a little something to think about. Somebody that's out in free space, that's not near any massive object, versus somebody in free fall. Because if you're in free fall, you don't feel gravity when you're in total free fall. Now, those two situations, you might say, well, yeah, gravity can't be real. I mean, a person sitting out in space, not, not anywhere near any mass, is going to feel the same no sensation as someone in free fall. But here's the big difference. The person in free fall is it going to experience time dilation because they're near a massive body? So that, that's another version of the twin paradox is that, you know, if you're near a massive body versus someone that's not, you're going to be aging more slowly. And we know this is true because GPS satellites have to account for time dilation and they have to account for the speed of the satellite too, but it turns out the time dilation is the bigger correction. So that is, that is showing us that there is something fundamentally different about gravity here. It's not just so simple. You can't just hand wave it away. So I just want to end with a little video clip here. And it's one of the best renditions of understanding general relativity because those big sheets with balls that roll around, those are, those, those are not the best ways to visualize relativity. This little video I'm going to show is a much better way of looking at it. So, so I hope you enjoy it and we'll, we'll come back and we'll wrap it up. Which I find to be the most appealing for visualizing general relativity. The Earth, because it is very massive, deformed space-time, giving it a curvature. For us, the curvature of space-time appears as an endless contraction of the grid. In technical terms, we say that the volume contained between geodesics shrinks over time because of the curvature. 
This grid that shrinks represents what we call inertial frames, frames in freefall. With respect to this grid, a body that is not subject to any force will conserve its movement. Thus, if we drop the apple with no initial velocity, as no force acts upon it, it will remain motionless relative to the grid, but as the grid contracts, the apple will fall. With this image of relativity, it is also easy to see that the surface of the planet is constantly accelerating upwards, because it is always going against the natural movement of the grid. Finally, if we throw an object sideways with an initial velocity, no force is applied on it, and it will therefore continue in a straight line within the grid. But as the grid contracts, the object is constantly pulled back towards the Earth. That's exactly how the Moon orbits the Earth, and the Earth orbits the Sun. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. It's just a very good visualization because it, 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 it's not perfect, obviously, because we can't visualize in four dimensions, but uh, very nice visualization. One of the things that it didn't mention there, which is part of the earlier part of the video, was that one of the reasons why, from, from this motion and this movement of space and time, downward to the surface of the Earth, it's, it's because of the, the clocks move slower on the surface versus higher up. And it's the difference in, in, the, in the rates of the clocks that's actually more important to the flow of the downward motion than even the space spatial component. But, but the point is, is from, this, from these flows and this curvature of space-time, you know, we can calculate effective potentials, equations of motion, and we can derive the real forces of gravity from them, forces that we can feel, use, and calculate. And again, all of our engineering, you know, incorporates these forces. So um, they are absolutely real. Gravity is absolutely real. And I did this video because, again, a lot of, a lot of misunderstandings about reference frames and fictitious forces. And I just hope this clarifies it at least a little bit. And again, thanks for watching and do please leave some comments and do like the video and subscribe to my channel. I have some more coming. So thanks again for watching and I hope you have a great night.